هنبدا السيشن بتاعتنا عن الساركوما والمحاضره الاولى هنشرب بتقديمها عنوانها ديسمويد تايب فايبروماتوزس توردس انيو تريتمنت ابروتش قدمها لنا الاستاذ الدكتور محمد كلاني اسوشيت بروفيسور اوف كلينيكال انكولوجي عين شمس نيفرس اتفضل يا دكتور محمد السلام عليكم شكرا دكتور ماهر على ذيس برزنتيشن انا محمد كلاني هتكلم النهارده على الديزمويت تيومر فيبروماتوزيس والنيو ايرا والتشينجينج في الجايد لاينز بتاعت التريتمنت اوف ذيس رير تايب اوف تيومر اتس ووركينج ناو ديزمويت تيومر از ا رير فايبرس تيومر اند ذا تيرم ديزمويت از درايف فروم ذا جريك تيرمينولوجي ويتس مين ذات تندر لايك It is a rare tumor. It is four to six cases per million in population per year, and the most common presentation is a soft tissue mass with or without pain, and the median age is 45 uh, years at presentation. At diagnosis, first imaging, the ultrasound usually a homogeneous tabulated hypoechoic mass, and in the CT is a wet circumscribed mass with a focal hyperattenuation pattern. And in, uh, in the MRI, it is low signal in T1 and high signal in T2 and uh, in homogeneous enhancement in T1 with uh, contrast. Also, the, to confirm diagnosis, it is must to take specimen called needle biopsy, in which we show monophasic, uh, monomorphic fibroblastic proliferation with positive to the immunohistochemistry to the beta catenin. Also, if I give um, some molecular pathways on the basis about the development of this type of tumor, it is mainly due to the accumulation of the so-called beta catenin uh, accumulation. The beta catenin accumulation is either due to mutation to so-called CTNNB1 mutation, which is present in 85% of the cases in the sporadic type, or associated with mutation in the fat complex protein which is a so-called germline FAB or FAB-associated desmoid tumor, and it is present in the 15% uh, of the population. Also, there is also pathways, uh, peripheral pathways, like the uh, WNT signaling pathway and the notch pathway uh, lead to the beta cannonin uh, accumulation. I will go directly to the management for sake of time about the desmoid fibromatosis. First of all, This is the most important slide and the most important message that the guidelines that is stating the surgery as upfront uh, line of treatment in 2010 is changing nowadays after 2020 into the surgery it must, must the first line of uh, treatment and it is the first line is the wait and see protocol. And during this gap of, uh, of years, the wait and see protocols step forward uh, become more and more evidence. Firstly, it put in the guidelines in uh, recurrent cases, then the wait and see protocol put in uh, primary irresectable, then later on the wait and see protocol put in uh, selected primary operable lesion, then nowadays the wait and see protocol put in all cases, even the operable one. Why we do this? Because the following evidence, Again, there is a technical uh, problem, yes. The firstly, the retrospective data about so-called spontaneous regression of the uh, desmoid uh, humors reported by a surgeon called Sylvian Bonville uh, from France do a retrospective analysis to more than 140 patients, either for wait and see protocol or for uh, an active treatment surgery or medical treatment. Surprisingly, that 29% of the patient with the wait and see protocol shows spontaneous regression. And this is a case reported in this study with anterior abdominal wall desmoid tumor, just wait and see protocol for less than two years and uh, almost disappeared. So what is interesting also in the arm who receiving medical treatment is do better in event free survival than the arm who underwent multiple surgical resection. Another retrospective data for more than 140 patients, again, uh, testing the wait and see protocol 
versus uh, medical uh, treatment. The progression free survival and the recurrent free survival is almost better in the wait and see uh, protocol as we see in this uh, second curve. Also, 50% of the patients with the primary cases avoid any type of treatment, uh, while either surgery or radiotherapy. And uh, there is a uh, prospective uh, randomized trial uh, made by the French sarcoma group to the desmoid fibromatosis for more than 770 patients. Half of this patient underwent surgery and half of the, this patient underwent wait and see protocol. As we see, they divide the patient into favorable location and unfavorable location. They find the favorable locations is anterior abdominal wall and the intra-abdominal breast and the lower limb. If we see the, in the favorable protocol, the wait and see protocol is almost equal to the surgery, but in unfavorable uh, locations, the wait and see do better even than the surgery alone. Also, there is data from the Deutsch consensus in the treatment of the FAB-associated desmoid tumor. They conclude that the, in the treatment of the intra-abdominal desmoid, just conservative approach uh, show comparable outcome as uh, surgery uh, as a line of treatment. So, our message to the surgeon, please avoid the cortex uh, brachial uh, reflex when you see a mass to do a directly uh, excisional uh, surgery and uh, take a biopsy, discuss the case in the MDT, make a proper pathological diagnosis and take time for immunohistochemistry and even molecular studies. And this is the guidelines in the uh, ISMO guidelines for 2020. Uh, the, they stated that the first line approach is the active surveillance for at least one to two years. Also, in the NCCN guidelines after 2021, they stated that observation by imaging and symptomatic management uh, until uh, progression, and after progression, they state other uh, line of treatment. So I will shift. What in case of we, the, we face a progressive desmoid fibromatosis? I will discuss again the guidelines. The guidelines nowadays also stating the systemic treatment, especially with mesotrexate in, as a first line in a progressive desmoid uh, tumor uh, in all sites, especially uh, except the abdominal wall. In the abdominal wall, we can consider uh, surgery. So I will shift to the systemic treatment in the progressive desmoid fibromatosis. First of all, there is an, a, a drug which we widely use in the daily practice, but with a limited or very low evidence-based uh, medicine, like the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, like tamoxifen, or doxorubicin, or begylated doxorubicin. Because it is easily available, it is well known in other uh, treatment of other cancer subtypes, we easily to use it in uh, daily practice. But the evidence to be used in this mod tumor is very little. In contrast, there is more and more evidence and big trials to demonstrating a well randomized trial for the efficacy of the sorafenib or the TKIs with bazovanib or the mesotrexate venblastin and the most recently with the ISMO update in 2022, the alpha, uh, the gamma inhibitors. This is the evidence for the mesotrexate venblastin for aggressive carcinomatosis. They showed that there is at least 40% uh, response rate uh, and the progression-free survival, the median progression-free survival is 33 months, which is do bit much better than any other systemic treatment used in the past, uh, tamoxifen or toxorobsin or uh, non -steroid. Also, sorafenib is tested in a three trial, superiority trial testing sorafenib 4 100 milligram per day versus placebo in more than 80 uh, patients with a progressive or symptomatic uh, or recurrent uh, desmoid tumor. As we saw, the curves is much, uh, is widely separated in, uh, in favor for the uh, sorafenib arm with the two-year progression-free survival, 31% versus 86% for the sorafenib arm. Also, the overall response rate is 33% for the sorafenib versus 20% for the placebo arm. 
Another drug called the Pazubanib is tested in a phase two open label randomized trial versus the mesotrexid vimblastin. Also, this drug shows the overall response rate with 37% for the Pazubanib versus 25% for the mesotrexid vimblastin, and almost comparable progression free survival with 83% versus 45%. It is clinically significant for Bazubani, but does not reach a statistical uh, significant value. The most uh, recently is so-called gamma secretase inhibitor, which is touching the notch pathway or WNT signaling pathway as we saw in the molecular pathogenesis. In a phase one trial, uh, or one B trial, so a significant tumor response and a deep response in the, in the patient who, who is desmoid fibromatosis. And this is a slide from ESMO uh, 2022 about the uh, newly published data, the phase three trial using the gamma secretase inhibitors. The trial uh, using the prog uh, progressive desmoid fibromatosis with treatment naive and randomized for a negro state like a gamma secretase inhibitor versus placebo. The result was a significant improvement in the symptom and the pain relief and also a, a, a response rate in comparison to the patient receiving the placebo. The most important side effect is the ovarian uh, dysfunction in the female in the child bearing period, which is very important, leading to the 75%. What about the role of radiotherapy? This slide is uh, divide a comparative review of 22 articles comparing the surgery group in the recurrent or progressive desmoid fibromatosis versus the surgery plus adjuvant radiotherapy, which is a familiar and the most common uh, daily practice used in a recurrent fibromatosis. We do surgery and give adjuvant radiotherapy or versus radiotherapy alone as a definitive treatment. What is interesting in this trial that the group who receiving surgery plus adjuvant radiotherapy or receiving radiotherapy alone like a definitive treatment, there is no significant difference between them. And so, in the consensus of the desmoid working group, they ask why we do uh, surgery if we can use uh, radiotherapy alone. So we can use radiotherapy as a definitive sole of treatment and surgery as a definitive sole uh, after recurrence from the radiotherapy. Also, nearly uh, uh, um, guidelines of the NCCN stated the, uh, the radiotherapy alone as a definitive treatment. In the past, if we see the guidelines of the ISMO uh, or the NCCN, they stating the radiotherapy only after surgery as an adjuvant treatment. Also, there is uh, data from retrospective uh, analysis from more than 100 patients who are receiving radiotherapy. This show, they saw that the age and the uh, type of the fractionation is significantly affecting the response rate and the local control rate. But they state that there is neither the gross or microscopic residual or versus a recurrent presentation or the number of the prior surgery affecting the result of the uh, radiation or the outcome of the radiation uh, if we use it uh, alone. The other slide is so-called isolated limb perfusion. It is a smart technique and is give a significant response rate in a challenging case of soft tissue sarcoma, including the desmoid uh, tumor. Uh, in this peculiar uh, subtype, in a case of the progressive uh, or recurrent uh, failed after medical treatment and radiotherapy, this can give a, a secret rule of response rate uh, with uh, CR uh, presented in uh, this evidence of the three data published, and also partial response is reported uh, by this technique. In Egypt, the machines is available, but the experience and the expert is less, it's not available uh, till now to underwent this technique in our country. Uh, I will finish with my presentation in, by the data published from the Desmoid Tumor Working Group, the, published in 2020. The seven major rules when you think or when you treat the desmoid fibromatosis. The first rule, the core needle biopsy is an most important for the diagnosis. 
an expert pathologist must examine this slide when CCTNB1 mutation is strongly recommended. Wait and see protocol is the first line option and imaging planned by MRI monitoring every uh, one to two months or uh, three to six months internally or a CT scan uh, to, uh, to uh, detect early progression. Also site specific and the stepwise approach should be considered the potentially uh, toxicity, especially for radiotherapy in young adults, should be carefully weighted and discussed in an MDT approach. Surgery should be considered if the R0 resection at level and in very selected cases. Health of related quality of life evaluation should be included in our patient's assessment in daily practice. Supportive care should be offered in this type of patients. And I will uh, show you a real cases uh, treated with uh, methotrexate venblastin in our uh, Inchamps University sarcoma uh, unit. This is a case of abdominal desmoid uh, fibromatosis treated by a nine months of methotrexate uh, venblastin only. After a recurrence, uh, they made twice surgery and the relapse is within two to three months after surgery. There is a significant improvement in the size and symptoms of the patient. Also, this case of the desmoid femitosis in the paravertebral muscles or retroperitoneals, uh, uh, the patient uh, underwent only excisional biopsy or biopsy excisional. The mesotoxate will be give a significant symptomatic improvement and size regression. And last one is the Gardner syndrome is a desmoid uh, fibromatosis with uh, FAB uh, syndrome. Uh, this patient also uh, came to us after make a total colectomy and the mass is uh, rapidly progressive uh, during the six months post-operatively biopsy desmoid fibromatosis was confirmed and again patient give a significant uh, tumor regression with uh, mesotoxid uh, uh This is our uh, ISMO sarcoma network. We, we believe and we dream to create in Egypt uh, like a network from different university, uh, from Mansoura, uh, uh, and uh, other university, Cairo University, and uh, the National Cancer Institute. Uh, our uh, belief uh, to uh, firstly to uh, strong our uh, data experience, uh, especially to this rare type of tumor, and discuss the challenging cases. Later on, we can collaborate in uh, uh, clinical trials and we can collaborate internationally with the clinical trials, inshallah. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for the informative lecture about uh, treatment of the Zemoy tumor. I have uh, two questions. Uh, okay. The role of platelet drift, uh, platelet drift cross factor and the secret in the Zemoy tumor. Is a role or not? No, the uh, platelet drift cross factor is uh, giving a role in the subtish sarcoma and they give an accelerated approval after phase two uh, trial due to improvement of the overall survivor. But actually, in after 2008, uh, uh, 2018, they uh, uh, removed this, withdrew this approval due to the phase three trial convert the non-superiority against the use of the standard treatment. Uh, as regards the CKET, we can uh, use some uh, response rate in the desmoid tumor showing uh, or expressing the CKET. We can use the metallic or anti uh, or clinic. Uh, second question about uh, radiotherapy. Is uh, the radiotherapy indicated after first surgery or, as we know, after third uh, redo operation? After first surgery, if a positive margin or wait and see? Uh, that's what I discussed the evidence about the systematic review for 2020 uh, 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 articles. They review that the radiotherapy can be used solo, alone, without uh, a surgery. If we can do a surgery by R0 resection, even at second or third, because in our daily practice, we, con we consider radiotherapy after the second recurrence in our unit. But nowadays, the consensus of the desmoid working tube 
uh, groups, they change this, uh, this uh, thinking, the way of thinking. We consider the radiotherapy can play alone. If you consider a surgery with R0, go for a surgery alone. But if you see that R0 is difficult, you can give definitive radiation alone. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a question from my uh, dear professor, please, Dr. Mohammed. Dr. Mohammed, thank you very much for your nice presentation. You. Uh, I would like to ask you something about the. Uh, what do you need from the pathologist to write in his report uh, inclu um, in case of fibromatosis? Fibromatosis, as you know, there are different grades, different and recurrent or not recurrent, and so on, and different sites. And for us as pathologists, um, sometimes uh, or many times, it's very difficult to reach the proper diagnosis. Yes. Now we have reached the proper diagnosis, and we sent you for proper treatments either surgery or you for oncology. Um, do you want anything specific from the pathologist to be written in the report for you, besides the diagnosis, the grade, and so on, and so on? Uh, the most important for us, uh, the margin, or uh, the resection, R0, or R1 resections, and the beta catenin expression. And if we have a luxury enough to do the molecular mutations, uh, CTNB1 mutation, uh, for targeted therapies, uh, the alpha secretase, it will be uh, thankful for the pathology. Okay. But at least uh, the, the margin and the immune chemistry or beta catenin uh, expression. Uh, Especially, uh, we do, we all, we, we do uh, also, uh, always do it in yeah. our lab. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Very good uh, job. Thank uh, you. Dr. Kilani, Dr. Mohammed, Thank you, Professor Mohammed, for your very nice presentation and talk. I have uh, two questions. What is the relationship between occurrence of the smooth tumor and uh, the observation that female complain from the smooth or occurrence of the smooth after cesarean section? Okay. Uh, very large number of female give a history of cesarean section and occurrence of the smooth tumor at the site of cesarean section. Yes. There is data about uh, the uh, rule of pregnancy and the induction or in, in increased size of this, this uh, tumor. Uh, we do believe that the, uh, the dysmoid is more common in the female, especially in the child bearing area, especially after delivery. But uh, they make a systematic review. They show that the pregnancy uh, make a clinically uh, uh, increase of the rate of dysmoid, but does not reach a statistical significance and it does not worse the prognosis. It's really a very important message that even the pregnancy and after the cesarean scarring does not worse the prognosis at all. But I, I agree with you that in daily practice, it is really common to see with a child being a female after the cesarean section or after pregnancy. Second question uh, about uh, the functional outcome. Why we don't uh, introduce this term in this moid to choose the proper treatment when the surgery will uh, will uh, decrease our functional outcome? We can give a, the patient radiotherapy. Yes, this is the message to our surgeon because when they uh, diagnose uh, soft tissue mass in the thigh or abdomen uh, with the characteria suspecting sarcoma. They go for surgery upfront. They does yes. not use. But uh, I think the management is uh, will be different totally if they take a biopsy and discuss in MDD. And uh, we believe if there is a biopsy confirming this way, and they discuss uh, the MDT approach, firstly we offer to the patient the wait and see protocol. And if the patient is symptomatic, we can give uh, systemic treatment even to avoid the surgery. We do believe that the repeated surgery make the recurrence very infiltrative and very aggressive to the patients. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, uh, for you. your uh, <laughs> time. Uh, we now move to second speaker, my dear colleague, Dr. Ahmed Ramadan, uh, professor of clinical oncology at Mansoura University. He will talk about the role of immune therapy in advanced soft sarcoma. Please, Dr. Ahmed.
السلام عليكم first of all I'd like to thank the, our professors and the chairpersons for introducing me thank you Dr. Mohamed Kilani and uh, the whole group of pensions for inviting me to uh, give uh, this lecture I hope it will be simple as I try to do Uh, my agenda will include an introduction. We will give a uh, brief about the tum tumor immune microenvironment, the immune checkpoint blockade as uh, the main uh, immunotherapy strategy used in most of the tumors nowadays, and especially in sarcoma. We will talk about the immune protective biomarkers that used to predict the response to uh, such a new treatment. And then we'll give a brief about the adoptive cell therapy as a new strategy as an immunotherapy for uh, sarcoma. I don't have any conflict of interest. Uh, first of all, we know that softer sarcoma is a rare tumor. It comprises uh, more less than one percent of all cancers in adults. We have more than 70 histotypes according to the last WHO classification. Uh, and there is substantial heterogeneity in uh, biology, genetics, and the clinical behavior. Uh, the metastatic softer sarcoma represents about 25 to 50 percent of patients and the median overall survival is still from 12 to 15 months for the metastatic disease and the five uh, year survival rates of less than 2%. So we are talking about a disease is very difficult in management. Uh, uh, the choices are very uh, uh, few and the heterogeneity of the disease uh, as regards the histopathology, as regards the genetics and the uh, clinical behavior make the uh, uh, problem uh, in management of such uh, disease. We, up till now, we still have the cytotoxic chemotherapy as a standard of care for most of our patients. Hopefully, most chemosensitive subtypes can respond to uh, chemotherapy, but still less than 50%. Some subtypes are completely chemorefractory, like the just uh, the uh, alvar softobart sarcoma and the solitary fibrous tumor. And we have now uh, some approvals for target therapy in the treatment of certain types, uh, 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 rare types which uh, express uh, uh, certain uh, 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 biomarkers like the CKET in just the mTOR inhibitors in malignant vicoma and the ARK inhibitors for inflammatory uh, myofibroblastic tumor. However, the use of immunotherapy has gained interest in soft tissue sarcoma treatment but the progress is still slower compared to uh, uh, other cancers. As we can see there, this, is the, uh, uh, this picture uh, give us an idea about how uh, uh, how the, 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 the immune system attack the cancer cell uh, uh, as a whole. Uh, the first of all, the cancer cell release uh, uh, cancer cell engines and then the cancer still engine uh, stimulate the dendritic cells which uh, uh, activate a type of cells called the engine presenting uh, cells and activate the cytotoxic uh, T cells and then this uh, cytotoxic T cells rush to the area where the tumor uh, is present and try to infiltrate the tumor and this is why we will talk about this, the importance of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes as a predictor of response to immunotherapy. Then with recognition of the cancer cells by the cytotoxic T cells, successfully the cell killing will happen and the uh, tumor will shrink. Uh, this is a group of uh, stimulatory factors and inhibitory factors that usually we see with immunotherapy. Uh, I will uh, emphasize about the uh, uh, BDL1 and BD1, which is uh, a common target now for antibodies uh, as an immunotherapy. Actually, it is an inhibitor molecule that inhibits the immune system to attack the uh, cancer cell. While there is other uh, factors, for example, uh, like the interleukin 10 and interleukin 4, uh, and also other factors like interferon alpha, do a stimulating, a stimulating effect for the uh, immune system. And all these factors are target now for many uh, different treatment for cancer and specifically for uh, sarcoma, including the chemotherapy and radiation therapy. We know that chemotherapy and radiation therapy has an important immune mediating effect. 
also the uh, immunotherapy, including the vaccines, interferon alpha, and uh, the uh, other uh, antibodies targeting the CTLA4, like ibrimumab, and other uh, targeting BDL1 and BD1. So uh, our role uh, in, uh, in, in immunotherapy is to harnessing the immune system against sarcoma. We have a lot of strategies. The first uh, of uh, these strategies is the use of immune checkpoint uh, blockade, uh, also the adaptive cell therapy using the CAR uh, T cells, the natural killer cells, the, uh, uh, the cancer vaccines, the oncolytic viruses, the uh, antibodies and the macrophages will uh, give a detailed uh, illustration about the role of immune checkpoint blockade as an important strategy in attacking sarcoma patients. We know that uh, on the cancer cell, we have uh, 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 a ligand for the BDL, uh, the BD, uh, the programmed death uh, ligand, which interact with the uh, programmed uh, death uh, one uh, available in the cytotoxic T cells and do an inhibition of their uh, action. This leads to uh, escape of the cancer cell from the immune system. So our strategy is to attack this type of receptors that are available on the T cells and inhib inhibiting uh, these receptors by using specific antibodies against BD1 and BDL1. So this will release the, the inhibitory effect of uh, BDL1 and BD1 on the immune system so the immune system can attack the uh, cancer cells. That is what's uh, usually called, we are releasing the brakes of the immune system to attack uh, the uh, tumor cells. Uh, not only the BD1 and the BDL1, we have also the CTLA4, which is now uh, is a target for uh, certain antibodies. And also, uh, specifically in sarcoma, we have the LAG3, the TIM3, and the VESTA. Uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitors are used to restore the anti-tumor uh, effect of uh, immune system. We will uh, look at the uh, clinical outcomes. Actually, we don't have any uh, phase three trials for immunotherapy in sarcoma. All the available evidence uh, is driven from small phase two trials or even case series or even case reports in very uh, rare uh, types of soft tissue sarcoma. Uh, this one of the uh, biggest trials that uh, showed the effectiveness of uh, bimbrozumab in advanced uh, soft tissue sarcoma. This trial included 40 patients with soft tissue sarcoma and another 40 patients with bone sarcoma uh, treated with membrozumab. We can see there in the uh, uh, table that uh, the uh, response rate in patients with undifferentiated bone sarcoma approaching 40%, while in the differentiated liposarcoma it was 20%, and only 10% in synovial sarcoma. There is only two clinical response, the clinical uh, response among the soft tissue sarcoma uh, cohorts. While in bone sarcoma, the response rate was only 5%. This means that bimbrozumab is not active in such type of uh, uh, tumors, which is the bone sarcomas. Uh, in order to uh, uh, build on the results of the uh, previous study, they do some expansion of the cohort of patients. They found that uh, undifferentiated morphic sarcoma and the differentiated liposarcoma are the most common histological subtypes respond to bombrizumab. So they did uh, another study, including 40 patients with undifferentiated polymorphic sarcoma and another 40 patients with de-differentiated liposarcoma, and they gave bimbrozumab. We can find that the objective response rate among uh, uh, patients with undifferentiated polymorphic sarcoma is 23%, and among patients with uh, de-differentiated liposarcoma is uh, only 10%. The other trial is the Alliance uh, trial, which uh, evaluated the effectiveness of the combination of anti-BD1 uh, nivolumab plus anti-CTLA4 uh, ibrimumab uh, in the treatment of unresectable or advanced metastatic uh, soft tissue sarcoma patients. Uh, they uh, included 38 patients in each group, and actually this was not a comparative study. It was randomized, but not comparative. Uh, they found that the combination of uh, immunotherapy have better response, 16% versus 5% in the uh, uh, NIVO alone arm. We can see here also the progression-free survival and the overall survival 
uh, on the left hand side uh, was the Nevo alone because it was not a comparative, so the, the graph is only for the Nevo and the other for the Nevo plus the AB. The overall survival was about uh, 10 months for the Nevo alone, and the progression free survival was less than two months. This means that when I give Nevolumab alone in such uh, advanced disease, we have only two months of disease free survival or progression free survival. Actually, with uh, the best chemo, the doxorubicin alone, we achieve more with uh, about four months as a progression free survival. And even the combination with Nevo plus AB, the progression free survival was about uh, four months comparable to what we achieved with single agent doxorubicin in uh, this advanced disease. Also, they did the same. They do an expansion of the most um, uh, re uh, responding uh, histological subtypes like the uh, undifferentiated polymorphic sarcoma and the differentiated liposarcoma. And they, uh, in this table, this was uh, 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 presented as uh, at the ASCO 2020. They uh, confirmed that the uh, undifferentiated polymorphic sarcoma and the differentiated liposarcoma responded well with the combination compared to the single agent, while patients who just didn't respond at all to uh, such uh, uh, type of treatment. Uh, specifically, uh, we have uh, alveolar soft part sarcoma is a type of uh, rare uh, soft tissue sarcomas that is a chemo refractory. The options for alveolar soft part sarcoma uh, is to give some target therapy, but uh, uh, we know from preclinical studies that this type of uh, cancer are immune hot. We call it immune hot. This means that there is high infiltration with tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and the high expression of BD1 and BDL1. So uh, this encourages the investigators to include 44 patients of uh, alveolar soft part sarcoma in a phase two study to assess the response rate to the anti BDL1 atezolizumab. They found that the response rate about 37%, including one complete response and 15 partial response, and the duration of response was a median of 16 months, uh, and about uh, 60 patients, 60% 60 patients have a stable disease. Uh, another large uh, French trial included several cohorts of rare cancers, and they gave bimbrozumab for these patients. The response rate was about 50%. This means that this type of uh, 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 rare sarcoma responded well to uh, immunotherapy. Uh, another trial, uh, soft, uh, another trials tried to find another type of uh, histologies uh, like the angiosarcoma. We know angiosarcoma is a rare uh, soft tissue sarcoma subtype but they uh, show uh, more or less uh, better response to uh, immunotherapy compared to other types of soft tissue sarcomas. In the DART trial, it was also a, a basket trial, including uh, multiple sites of rare cancers. They including about 16 patients with angiosarcoma, the response rate uh, approaching 60% uh, in this trial, and the six month BF BFS approaching 40%. And another case series of, from Miami found that the partial response to uh, five out of seven patients with angiosarcoma, especially who have cutaneous sarcoma. So what we learned from all this trial that there is differential response to immunotherapy based on the histological uh, subtype. And up till now, we can use the histological subtype as a surrogate to choose which patient we may benefit a lot from uh, the addition of immunotherapy. Uh, the histological subtypes responded uh, more to immunotherapy are the undifferentiated polymorphic sarcoma, de-differentiated liposarcoma, alpha soft part sarcoma, mixofibrosarcoma, and uh, cutaneous uh, angiosarcoma. So to understand what is happening uh, on and why there is some types of such sarcoma respond and the other types didn't respond, we should uh, try to uh, again go to the uh, tumor microenvironment and try to search about the KP layer in immune activation. We know that dendritic cells, as we, I mentioned in the start of the lecture, that they activate the cytotoxic T cells against the cancer cells. While the macrophages also play an important role, but we have also a KP layer that try to do the reverse by immunosuppression including the BD1, BDL1, CTL4, and others, and also include what's called the regulatory T cells and some uh, types of macrophages called M2, uh, which uh, make the immune system uh, in a suppressed way so the cancer cell can uh, uh, escape the immune response. 
in order to improve the efficacy of immunotherapy, uh, the investigators try to overcome this uh, possible mechanism of, of resistance, including the uh, T regulatory cells, uh, tumor associated macrophages, and suppressive cytokines like uh, vascoendothelial uh, growth factor. One of these strategies is to combine chemotherapy, uh, sorry, is to combine immunotherapy with other drugs. And we know that chemotherapy drugs active in sarcoma like the cyclophosphamide and doxorubicin play an important role in modifying the immune response against the tumor cells. For example, we know that cyclophosphamide suppresses the T regulatory cells, augmented the T cytotoxic cells and natural killer cells. Uh, when it added to bimbrozumab in the bimbrozumab trial, also the doxorubicin, we have some evidence, a variety of uh, cancers induce the release of uh, doxorubicin can induce the release of damage associated markers, increase the uh, interferon alpha production, and this Im improve the immunogenicity. One of these trials that tried to combine immune checkpoint inhibitors with chemotherapy in order to improve uh, the outcome uh, is this phase one, two trial, uh, combined bimbrozumab and doxorubicin in 37 patients. We can see here in the up the waterfall uh, uh, graph, the response rate was high, and uh, the response rate was higher also in the same histological subtypes improved uh, uh, in the uh, previous studies. We can also here in the spider graph, we can see that the, we have durable response uh, rate approaching about three or four uh, years with uh, the combination of doxorubicin and uh, bimbrozumab. Another study evaluates the efficacy of combining bimbrozumab with uh, target therapy, including the axtinib as a vascular endothelial growth factor, because we know that one of the mechanisms of resistance to immunotherapy is the expression of vascular endothelial growth factor. So they target the uh, BDL1 as an inhibitory molecule and also target the vascular endothelial growth factor, and they applied this study in the alveolar soft part sarcoma group again because we know that it is an immune hot tumor. They are more likely to respond to the uh, uh, immunotherapy. They have a very good response uh, approaching uh, 30, 35% and also the uh, three month progression field survival was improved. And they did a histological uh, or uh, pathological study they too, uh, took a tumor uh, biopsy from the alveolar soft part sarcoma. They found that they have high tumor infiltrating lymphocyte infiltration and BDL1 exhibition, suggesting that uh, uh, tumors that uh, uh, have all these uh, tumor infiltrates more likely to respond to uh, immunotherapy. Uh, and they also included some uh, other tumors in the study and found that, as you can see on the uh, uh, left hand side that patient with alveolar soft bar sarcoma uh, makes good uh, in comparison as regards the progression through survival and over or survival compared to uh, other uh, histological subtypes. There is other study combining sunitinib plus uh, nivolumab with a good response approaching uh, 48 uh, percent. This uh, uh, a summary uh, table including all the studies uh, have uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor as a single agent or as a combination with chemotherapy or uh, TKIs. Uh, one of the last studies is uh, combining terabactidin with ibrumab and delivolumab, and it, it was presented in the last ISMO, uh, pre uh, presenting the uh, data about the, their role in leomyosarcoma with good uh, uh, response rate. So uh, what we learned from all these studies that we have some subtypes of uh, uh, soft sarcomas that respond good to immunotherapy and we still will depend on the histology alone as a surrogate for immune response. But actually we should search for another predictors of response. Unfortunately in, in sarcoma the common biomarkers that usually used in other cancers like the BD1, BDL1 and tumor mutational burden and the microstellate instability when we apply it in sarcoma, we found that the expression of these markers is less compared to the hot tumors like the melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer, and renal cell carcinoma. For example, in the SARC uh, O2A trial uh, investigating the role of uh, bimrozumab as a single agent, they found that uh, only three patients of the 70 enrolled have more than 1% BDL1 expression. These other studies even found a very low uh, percent of uh, expression for BDL1. This means that 
if I depend on BDL1, it, it may be correlated with response, but actually it is, the prevalence is very low. This is also uh, the extension of the SARC-08 uh, trial, uh, which included uh, an expansion of uh, patients who responded well in the first uh, 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 trial. They found that responders have a higher expression of BDL1 uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and tumor associated macrophages, and this was associated with better progression free survival. So, this gives us some idea about some biomarkers that may help us to choose patient for uh, immunotherapy. Also, in the trial investigating the role of bimbrozumab in and axinib in alpha soft blood sarcoma, found that there is 52% expression of BDL1. Similarly, in the atelizumab, about 5 out of 44 patients have BDL1 expression. Uh, what about the tumor mutational burden? Uh, because it, uh, it will give uh, an FDG approval for any patient with solid tumors who have a tumor additional burden more than 10 uh, per uh, megabase to have benefit from immunotherapy. Actually, we, uh, this is a large study that included more than 160 uh, patients who received immunotherapy from four different cancer sites. And when we look at the sarcoma, we have only 5% to have tumor additional burden high. This means that only 5% of sarcoma are tumor, tumor mutational burden high. However, the response to immunotherapy was higher in uh, patient compared to uh, other uh, 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 who didn't have. Uh, this is also a, a, a gene signature study that classified patient into five groups. The uh, red one are the uh, sarcoma immune class high and the uh, blue one is the sarcoma immune class uh, 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 low. And they found that patients who have uh, gene expression for uh, immune markers have better response and have better progression-free survival and have better uh, overall uh, survival. Uh, so the conclusion about the immune checkpoint inhibitors, the response is not very good, about from 5 to 10 percent due to variability in the histological subtypes. We have some subtypes uh, have good response, and we should have different immunotherapeutic strategies like adaptive cell uh, therapy. Adaptive cell therapy means that I will retrieve the uh, T cells from the patient, then these T cells will be augmented uh, ex vivo in the lab, and we uh, will uh, 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 mark this T cells with what's called T cell receptor, then reinfuse this T cells inside the body again after doing a lymphodepletion of the patient by using conditioning chemotherapy, something like bone marrow transplantation. Uh, in short sarcoma, uh, there is uh, a role of adaptive T therapy, especially in uh, tumors that have translocation-based tumors, including the uh, synovial sarcoma, and also the uh, myxoid round cell uh, liposarcoma. This is one of the early studies that included only 20 patients with synovial sarcoma found an overall response rate of about 50% using autologous T cells expressing uh, uh, New York esophageal uh, one uh, 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 marker. Uh, another trial, uh, the spearhead trial, included also uh, patients with uh, synovial sarcoma and patients with myxoid round cell liposarcoma. They evaluated the use of MAG uh, MAGE A4 autologous T cells reinfused in these patients, and the response rate was uh, uh, up to 59%. Uh, actually, uh, this type of therapy is associated with what's called cytokine release syndrome, uh, but in this uh, study, the, it was about uh, grade 2 or, uh, or lower. Uh, we have some challenges in applying immunotherapy in a uh, wide scale in patients with uh, soft tissue sarcoma because most of the sarcomas are immunologically cold. Lack of immune response for most commonly known histological subtypes. However, uh, uh, the small sample size in, involved in the clinical trials and the heterogeneity of biomarker uh, exploration, we're still trying to find which biomarker will help us to select the patient for clinical trials or even for uh, our uh, work. Finally, I would like, would like to thank you for uh, 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 listening, and uh, uh, I am happy for any questions.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed, uh, for your uh, excellent presentation. You target a special point in sarcoma immune therapy. I think it is in a growing point uh, until now. Uh, my opinion about the pathology, I think uh, it is must be to incorporate the pathologist with the oncologist. I think another pathway it is present in this uh, sarcoma type of sarcoma. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for your very nice presentation and the very illustrative talk. Uh, I think uh, the problem in immunotherapy is about the pathogenesis of the sarcoma, molecular pathogenesis. We all of us know that the molecular pathogenesis mostly translocation, chromosomal trans trans translocation, not mutation. Very rare to mutation occur in sarcoma. Second point about self-tolerance. Epithelial tissue has a barrier from immune system. Basement membrane is a barrier. So just the cell invade the basement membrane, expose the two immune system. But the mesenchymal tissue, this point is lost. It's uh, the mesenchymal tissue actually in direct interaction with immune system I either the normal cells or malignant cells. You agree with me? Yes, uh, I agree with you because we, uh, as we uh, just mentioned, that most of the uh, histologies that respond to immunotherapy are histologies that have complex uh, genetic uh, alterations, while those who have translocation like synovial sarcoma and myxoid liposarcoma didn't uh, respond well to immune checkpoint inhibitors. But the hope is they may respond well, uh, like in sarcoma and the other hematological <coughs> malignancies, uh, to uh, CAR T uh, therapy and uh, adaptive cell therapy. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed Ramadan, for your interesting and um, very nice presentation. Um, for me, as a pathologist, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And I will add my opinion to my dear professor, colleague, that. Uh, pathology is very, very much needed in your topic, and it will be uh, more convenient if you add a, a concomitant uh, slides of the cases with the histological presentation with the immune cells in it in correlation with your immune therapy. I think it, um, this will be very, very important for you and for the audience to uh, to reach the idea. Uh, about this immune therapy, is it widely used here in Egypt? Yes, we or we there are some for obstacles for or... Types of cancers like uh, melanoma, non-small cell line cancer, green and cell carcinoma. Uh, it is approved nowadays in uh, 20 types of cancer. But uh, still in sarcoma, it is according even to even the guidelines, I uh, advise it as a, a common goal in, in solid tumors that have tumor mutational burden more than uh, 10. But as I uh, mentioned that 5% only of sarcomas have tumor mutational burden. So if we did it in our it's day going. Practice, we will find a very small number of patients they may uh, be eligible for immunotherapy and soft tissue. Yes, yes. Thank and you. This is an expensive treatment and it is difficult to offer it without uh, a predictive biomarker that predict the response uh, uh, to immune therapy. Thank you very much, Dr. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Now we move to uh, pathology presentation. My dear colleague, Professor Dr. Hoda Abu Gabal, Professor of Pathology at Shams University, and she's going to uh, give us an idea about the ancillary techniques in the evaluation of bone and soft tissue neoplasm. Our objective today 
in this talk to reviewing ancillary techniques in the evaluation of bone and soft tissue neoplasm, highlight on more highlighting novel immunohistochemical markers serving as surrogates for molecular genetic alterations, attempting to recognize those situations where molecular testing remains necessary. The recent fifth edition of Soft Tissue and Bone Tumors, WHO, uh, has introduced many tumors, as you can see, of different lineage, and several tumors have been added to these editions, like MZR the EWSR1 SMAT3 positive fibroblastic tumors, superficial CD34 positive fibroblastic tumors, and emerging entity of n track rearranged spindle cell neoplasm. And the entity of undifferentiated round cell sarcoma becomes established in this edition in comparison to the previous one. And that is the WHO classification of bone tumors. No several additions have been added. So, as you can see, we have a heterogeneous group of bone and soft tissue sarcoma and tumors. And according to the WHO working group, these tumors can be classified according to their behavior into benign, intermediate, locally aggressive, intermediate, rare metastasizing, and malignant tumors. Diagnosis of soft tissue tumors, rather than bone tumors, is very challenging, as all we know. This can be attributed to the rarity of each tumor type, remarkable histologic diversity, and the frequent limited biopsy, which give limitation in the classification of tumor and limitation in grading. However, correct classification remains crucially important for patient management and prognosis. The diagnosis depends on the histopathological examination and other ancillary techniques, including immunohistochemical and molecular testing. According to the histopathological examination by light microscopy, soft tissue tumors has a diversity of morphology. The cell shape can range from being a spindle cell, epithelioid cell, pleomorphic cell, round cell, and different growth pattern, like fibrosarcoma-like pattern, story form pattern, biphasic pattern, fibromatosis pattern, and background of either stromal hybridization or myxoid tumor, and with plexiform blood vessels. So we can see there's overlap between tumors of soft tissue in the morphology. So how can I reach to a diagnosis of soft tissue tumor? First of all, I have to apply morphology-based diagnostic approach and generate differential diagnosis. That can help me to collect the morphological criteria first in a certain uh, differential diagnosis like round cell tumor, spindle cell tumor, epithelioid tumor, pleomorphic tumor. And then I'm going to ancillary technique. Ancillary technique can be immunohistochemistry or molecular testing. Regarding immunohistochemistry, conventional immunohistochemistry attempts are insufficient in some cases to achieve a specific diagnosis. As we can see, smooth muscle actin in my fibroblastic sarcoma, the same pattern diffuse and strong as smooth muscle actin in layer of myosarcoma. So many new, much more specific immunohistochemical markers have been developed. Spe specific the lineage restricted transcription factors like myogenin and myoD1, H caldesmon, SOX10 for the neural tumor, SADB2 for the osteosarcoma or other tumors with osteoplastic differentiation. And most important that in the last three decades, many broad, consistent, and recurrent molecular events in certain tumor types are emerged, allowing emerging of new diagnostic immunohistochemical markers that can serve as useful surrogates for molecular genetic alterations. Molecular diagnostic method can include karyotyping, FISH, for instance, in cytohybridization or SISH, RT-PCR, and next generation sequencing. Molecular alterations in soft tissue tumors and bone tumors as well mainly, mainly encompass gene fusion and rearrangement. This is the largest category of the recurrent alteration in sarcoma is the translocation. Amplification can be also seen in some tumors, mutations including deletions of genes, single nucleotide variants mutation can also happen in some tumors, and apparent mycelation can 
occur in some tumors like malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. One new scope for FISH technique, like EWSR1, SSET in synovial sarcoma, FAS in myxoid liposarcoma, FOX1 in alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, MDM2 in well differentiated liposarcoma and de differentiated liposarcoma, and in uh, parastial osteosarcoma and low grade central osteosarcoma. But of course, sometimes fish only with one probe cannot give us the detailed and cannot know the partner of the translocation. So now we can use fish with two probes or even three probes or PCR, which can include several uh, detection of uh, uh, fusions genes or top and more advanced the next generation sequencing. Let's focus on some important soft tissue tumors like lipomatous tumor. Lipomatous tumor, I'm going to discuss the spindle cell pleomorphic lipoma, a typical spindle cell pleomorphic lipoma, which is considered to be benign but can have a diagnostic dilemma with a typical lipomatous tumor slash well differentiated liposarcoma. A typical spindle cell pleomorphic lipoma, it is CD34 positive and characterized by retroplastoma gene loss but no MDM2 or CDK4 amplification like the atypical lipomatous tumor. This a photo for a typical spindle cell and polymorphic lipomatous tumor. It can cause diagnostic dilemma with the atypical lipomatous tumor. Here we can see here we can see can see CT34 positivity and loss of the retinoplastoma gene. Another important entity, a typical lipomatous tumor and DD differentiated liposarcoma, which is characterized by MDM2 and CDK4 amplification. Immunohistochemistry, we can see immunohistochemistry for MDM2 and the amplification the giant chromosome for MDM2. Uh, when comparing uh, molecular versus immunohistochemistry, FISH for MDM2 amplification is more specific than immunohistochemistry for MDM2. Also, this type of amplification can be found in D-differentiated liposarcoma, and we can see here in the, this image the, uh, the amplification of the MDM2 gene. Another important type of liposarcoma, myxoid liposarcoma, which can be low-grade myxoid liposarcoma or high-grade round cell liposarcoma. It is characterized by molecular alteration of DDT-IT3 uh, uh, translocation, either with FAS more commonly or with less commonly EWSR. Recently, a surrogate marker of DDT-IT3 has been emerged, which can act as a surrogate marker, but uh, nowadays, no uh, data can be available to be widely uh, uh, to be widely used or not, and it can be useful in low grade and in high grade lesions when there is no any conventional area of low grade myxoid liposarcoma. It can act as a screening, but however, the molecular testing is preferable till now. And that is example of low grade myxoid liposarcoma, showing the DTIT3 nuclear staining and also the translocation of DTIT3 gene. And again, also it can, uh, DTIT3 translocation can be found in high-grade myxoid liposarcoma. Finally, pleomorphic liposarcoma, it can show uh, retinoplastoma loss by immunohistochemistry and by karyotyping, it shows complex karyotyping only with no other molecular alteration. Come to an important family group of rhabdomyosarcoma. Rhabdomyosarcoma includes embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, and spindle and or sclerosing rhabdomyosarcoma and polymorphic rhabdomyosarcoma. In embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, the myo D1 and the myo gene in immunohistochemistry are heterogeneous, characterized for heterogeneous staining for desmin, myo genine, and myo D1. No molecular uh, driving event can occur or can be found in uh, embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. Regarding alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, it uh, care in pediatric group or adolescent or young adult. It is round pattern of cells, 
it can show homogeneous in contrast to the embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, homogeneous staining of desmin, myogenin, and myo D1, and diffuse staining at the same time. And it is characterized by translocation FOX1 fusion, either with partner PAX3 or PAX7. And another types of spindle and sclerosing types, we have myo D1 mutant rhabdomyosarcoma, which is characterized by myo D1 diffuse staining, it's important here to use myoD1 in spindle or sclerosing rhabdomyosarcoma. And another type, which is congenital type, VGLL2, NOCO A2, which is characterized by myoD1 staining rather than myogenin. And, a and another type of spindle and sclerosing rhabdomyosarcoma, TFCP2, which occur in bone and showing myoD1 also staining rather than myogenin. So, in sclerosing and Spend the rhabdomyosarcoma, I have to use myoD1 rather than myogenin or desmin. And the polymorphic rhabdomyosarcoma, it occurs in old age and showing polymorphic cells and the myogenic markers like myogenin or desmin show focal positivity. Come to the alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. Nowadays, also emergent is a surrogate immunohistochemical markers, which is PAX3, PAX7, FOX1 which is then not widely adopted. However, the molecular alteration is very important. PAX3, FOX1 fusion, which can occur in 80% of the cases. PAX7, FOX1 fusion occur in 20% uh, in many institutes, especially in pediatric. Molecular conformation of all in the diagnosed case is routinely performed. We can discuss now the immunohistochemical and molecular feature of other spindle cell tumor like solitary fibrous tumor. Solitary fibrous tumor can give positivity for CD34 and STAT6. STAT6, it is a protein product of the fusion of NAP2 and STAT6 fusion. Uh, when I'm comparing immunohistochemistry or molecular, STAT6 is widely adopted and it is even more better than the genetic analysis for this fusion. So STAT6, it is very, very uh, reliable uh, surrogate marker for solitary fibrous tumor and it has privilege that it can stain the solitary fibrous tumor and the malignant solitary fibrous tumor as well. This uh, staining cannot be lost in the malignant transformation, unlike CD34, which can be totally lost in the malignant solitary fibrous tumor. Come to the inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor. It can stain non-specific staining for smooth muscle actin, and about 60% can show ALK positivity, and about 10% ROS1 positivity. By genetics, I can detect ALK fusion with several partners and ROS1 fusion. This importance can uh, give targeted therapy. It's important to detect for confirmation of diagnosis and further for targeted therapy. Another tumor, infantile fibrosarcoma and NTARC rearranged spindle cell neoplasm. The immunohistochemical markers is PAN-TARC. PAN-TARC containing TARC1, TRAC2, track three. In infantile fibrosarcoma, there is a specific translocation code ATVF and track three fusion, which is it's available here in 57, uh, we have a Munkin diagnostic in infantile fibrosarcoma. Like in the immunohistochemistry for pan track, it is showing low specificity. So the molecular testing is better in infantile fibrosarcoma. Regarding N-TRAC rearranged spindle cell neoplasm. N-TRAC rearranged spindle cell neoplasm it is a new entity which has been emerged in the new version of WHO. Uh, it is a very infiltrative uh, tumor, can occur in deep soft tissue or subcutaneous, and it has a wide range of morphology, which ranging from uh, light fibromatosis neural-like areas to high-grade uh, morphology like malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. A clue for this diagnosis of this entity is CD34 and S100. CD34 and S100 positivity, either diffused or focally, can give clue and make the pathologist think that this tumor can be related to the n track rearranged spindle cell neoplasm. And pan, pan track can use as a screening marker, but I can't depend on it alone. I have to proceed to molecular testing further after doing pantorch immunohistochemistry. Again, the advantage of getting the, the molecular testing for 
and track one, two, three fusion, is there is possibility for the targeted therapy. Another entity, low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma, epithelioid sclerosing fibrosarcoma, which can be stained with MAC4, and it's showing genetic expression for fusion, FAS1 fusion. Come to the synovial sarcoma. Synovial sarcoma can, immunohistochemistry stain, can stain by EMA, cytokeratin, tele one but I have concerns about tele one Nowadays, I have noticed that synovial sarcoma has been up, uh, over-diagnosed. Many cases are diagnosed as synovial sarcoma, and this can be attributed to the positivity of TELI1. TELI1, according to the literature nowadays, and according to the experience, it is non-specific marker. So it's better to, done, to do EMA, cytokeratin, and then proceed to the molecular testing for SS18, SSX1, 1, 2, 4 fusion genes, which can done by PCR. And this, this, this service is now available in Egypt also. Uh, recently, a uh, surrogate marker of SS18, SS6 uh, has been uh, emerged. It's good. It can be good marker according to the literature. It is highly specific, highly sensitive, but not as good as the molecular testing. Synovial sarcoma, showing tele one positivity is non-specific and showing the newly emerged marker. Another spindle cell tumor like malignant peripheral nerve cyst tumor show focal S100, SOX10, and sometimes this neural marker can be completely negative. So malignant peripheral nerve cyst tumor is likely to be a diagnosis of by exclusion of other high-grade sarcoma. Uh, a surrogate marker of loss of H3K27 methylation 3 has been emerging. It is a specific marker, but its sensitivity is very low. It's about 30% sensitivity. And it is also found more in high-grade malignant peripheral nerve cyst tumor. Here is a malignant peripheral nerve tumor, and this showing loss of H3K27 methylation 3 antibody. Another entity, pseudomyogenic hematuric endothelioma. This is entity of vascular tumor, and it is a borderline tumor, and it is characterized by sensitivity for cytokeratin, ERG, CD31, and FOSIP. FOSIP it is a surrogate marker and the product of the fusion of FOSIP uh, fusion with serbine gene, fusion gene and it is a reliable marker as well. Come to the epithelioid cell tumor, uh, like alveolar soft bar sarcoma, which has a surrogate marker of TFE3, which it is the protein product of TFE3, alveolar soft bar sarcoma, uh, CR1 fusion. It is a reliable uh, surrogate marker for the alveolar soft part sarcoma. Also, as you know, that there is no specific marker for alveolar soft part sarcoma. I depend only on the morphology and the pattern of being epithelioid cell and the PS staining if I found a crystal, and then TFE3 is very helpful. And another epithelioid tumors like Picoma and epithelioid hematuric endothelioma, subset in this tumor can have positivity for TFE3 immunohistochemistry. Like in epithelioid hematuric endothelioma, it shows positivity for CD34, CD31, ERG, and cytokeratin in 30%, and surrogate marker CAMP-A1. This is the most common uh, genetic alteration, is the fusion of WWTR1 and the CAMP-A1, and the surrogate marker for CAMP-A1 is helpful and reliable. And as I mentioned before, that there is a small subset of epithelioid hematuric endothelioma less than 10% showing fusion of TFE3. TFE3 can be difficult in interpretation in the epithelioid hematuric endothelioma. Other markers, other sorry, other tumors like epithelioid sarcoma, epithelioid malignant peripheral nerve tumor, malignant rhabdoid tumor, poorly differentiated chordoma, extraskeletal myxoid chondro sarcoma, soft tissue myoepithelioma can share loss of any one. Loss of any one, it is representing the genetic of inactivation of a smart B1 gene. Uh, it is very reliable marker in epithelioid sarcoma, and as we can see, it can lost in other entity. So, in these tumors and differential diagnosis, I depend on morphology, I depend on other immunohistochemical, and and the, and determine the final diagnosis in the context of the additional immunohistochemical markers. Epithelioid sarcoma show positivity for cytokeratin, EMA, CD34, and ERG. 
Here a case of epithelioid sarcoma showing any one loss. Extraskeletal myxoid condor sarcoma can some subset of this entity show loss of any one, but no specific marker really for this entity, and it is mainly dependent on the molecular uh, testing of NR4S3 rearrangement, which is mostly commonly used EWSR1 fusion partner. Regarding the round cell tumor of soft tissue and bone, the category of undifferentiated round cell sarcoma, including EMIC sarcoma, EWSR1 non ETS round cell sarcoma, CES rearranged sarcoma, sarcoma with before genetic alteration, have been established in this entity of uh, WHO edition, and EMIC sarcoma, the key of immunophenotypes showing diffuse CD99 staining. And now there is surrogate marker NKX22. Fly1 and the ERG1 are not recommended to be used. EWSR1 non ETS3 round cell sarcomas, it can be EWSR1 uh, or FAST NEFAT C, which show CD99 positivity and NKX22 in some cases and the cytokeratin positivity. And EWSR1 PATS1 showing CD99 positivity and the co expression of myogenic and the neurogenic markers. Come to the cess rearranged sarcoma, which occur more common in soft tissue and in children and young adult. Cess docs, molecular alteration found in 95% of these cases, and it show variable CD90 positivity. It can be patchy, it can be completely lost. And the surrogate marker are WT1 and ETV4, and can be used reliably. Sarcoma with before genetic alteration, more to occur in bone rather than soft tissue and common in children and young adults and the molecular alteration is before cycling B3 fusion and it also can show CD99 positivity or negativity and the surrogate marker are the before which is less specific and the cycling B3 which is better than before. Here first row showing Ewing sarcoma with diffuse strong CD99, the characteristic pattern, and NKX22 positivity, which is nowadays a surrogate marker, and it is, uh, it is very sensitive in this type of Ewing sarcoma. Cess rearranged uh, round cell sarcoma showing patchy CD99 and the surrogate marker ETV4. Before rearranged sarcoma showing negativity for CD99 and before positivity or can show cyclin B three positivity. Come to the mesenchymal chondrosarcoma. Mesenchymal chondrosarcoma, no specific marker for it. It can stain for CD99, SOX9, but is not available here in Egypt, NKX2 or NKX3. And the better for diagnosis of mesenchymal chondrosarcoma is detection of Hay NOCA A2 uh, uh, translocation, which can occur in more than 90% of the cases. Small cell osteosarcoma, diagnosed molecularly by immune histochemical by sat 2 and CD99, but no molecular alteration can be found in this entity. Come to uh, selected cases of bone tumors, like osteoblastoma or osteoid osteoma, recently a marker of FOS, which is a product of FOS rearrangement in more than 90% cases of osteoblastoma and osteoid osteoma, has been found and it can be used in to be differential diagnosis osteoblastoma from the osteoblastoma osteolite or sarcoma. Chondroblastoma has a surrogate marker of K36M, which is representing a methylation mutation of histone gene H33B. It is highly sensitive and a specific marker. Giant cell tumor also, a surrogate marker of G34W, a sensitive and specific marker due to histone uh, mutation of H33A gene and come to the paraosteal osteosarcoma and the low grade central uh, osteosarcoma, which can show MDM2 amplification and CDK, CDK4 amplification and immunohistochemical showing diffuse strong positivity nuclear staining for this marker. Paraosteal osteosarcoma and low-grade central osteosarcoma show amplification of MDM2 and CDK4, and the molecular testing is again is better than immunohistochemical. But according to the experience here of MDM2, when I interpret it in the uh, the radiological and the clinical context of the case, it can be helpful. 
because we don't have here MDM2 uh, amplification gene or the molecular testing for getting the amplification. But when I see just small cells are stained by the MDM2, I can't overrate it and call it paraosial osteosarcoma. It, it can be and it must be uh, yeah, uh, a scattered and frequent uh, cells showing nuclear staining of MDM2. Come to the chondroma and the chondrosarcoma. Uh, it shows mutation for IDH1 and IDH2. The role of immunohistochemical of a surrogate marker for this mutation is very limited and is showing low sensitivity. And the importance of IDH1 or IDH2 can be helpful to differentiate chondrosarcoma, especially high grade, from the chondroplastic osteosarcoma. In conclusion, we can conclude that sarcoma are heterogeneous group, as we can see. Accurate diagnosis is a challenge. To start with morphology and to create differential diagnosis, apply immunohistochemistry. There are immunohistochemical markers that can act as reliable surrogate for molecular testing in the diagnosis of sarcomas. Some of these markers can have significant implication for patient therapy, like ALK and PANTARC inhibitor. Although it is important to be aware for, of the limitation of each immunohistochemical marker to, to interpret staining pattern within the clinical and histological context. There is limitation in interpretation of immunohistochemical markers, even the surrogate markers. So I have to be aware of this point. And also be aware to recognize those situations where molecular testing remains necessary. And finally, all this can be happened by the multidisciplinary team approach. And thank you. Thank you very much, dear Dr. Hoda. Uh, very interesting, uh, hard, <laughs> but very important. Um, any question? Pasolji, ba? <laughs> okay, thank you very much, dear Professor Hod. Thank you. Thank you.